Hi guys, it is turning into a spectacularly gorgeous December day here deep in the heart of Texas here in, in mid-December of 2019, in the closing days of 2019, here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. And my name is Sam Mitchell and you have for some reason found your way to Collapse Chronicles where this week I have the long overdue pleasure and honor of speaking to I think the firstborn native Texan I have ever interviewed in my life on Collapse Chronicles and this would be environmental activist Diane Wilson. Uh, she's about three or four hours from me right now down in the big town of Sea Drift, Texas. For those of you not aware of Diane Wilson or want to be reacquainted, Diane Wilson is an activist shrimper and all-around hellraiser from Texas. She's the author of, of several books, including <clears throat> and. Uh oh, the what is I? You know, I keep saying the 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 wrong word, an unreasonable woman, and that was followed up by Diary of an Eco Outlaw with a foreword by Derek Jensen. Uh, a little bit more about Diane. This this is from Amazon.com. <clears throat> Wilson delivers a no-holds-barred account of how she, a fourth-generation shrimper, former boat captain and mother of five, took a turn at midlife, unable to stand by quietly as she witnessed abuses of people and the environment. Since then, she has launched legislative campaigns, demonstrations, and hunger strikes and generally gotten herself in all manner of trouble. So, Diane Wilson, come on and say hi to the folks at Collapse Chronicles, and let's get you further into all manner of trouble along with me. Why, well, thank you very much, Sam, and I'm real pleased to be here. Okay, let's start out with, so you were born and raised on the, on the coast of, of Texas in Calhoun County, which, uh, just try to describe to people who have never seen these giant petrochemical plants with the backdrop of these beautiful, formerly pristine marshes. What is What has it been like to grow up on the coast of Texas and watch all of this j just happen around you? <clears throat> well, it was, uh, you have to understand that... Uh, I'm from Sea Drift, so that is probably one of the last authentic fishing villages on the whole Texas Gulf Coast. And I mean, the entire town was commercial fishermen. And the heart of the town was the bay. It was the docks. And all the boats were down there. The families would go down there. It was in every shrimp season or the beginning of a... Uh, new season. It was it was like a ritual or a festival, and I I I remember I can remember going down there when I was five years old because my dad was coming in on the shrimp boat or whatever, and I can vividly remember and and I could see the bay. I mean, I literally could see her, and she was an old woman and she really liked me and she really liked me to come down there so i have got a real uh mystical approach to the bay it's alive and it had a a spirit and uh there was uh actually if you could go out on a boat on a shrimp boat real early in the morning and you could be hitting those waves and you could be hitting that salt air and it's like the molecules in your skin would just separate and the bay would move into it. So uh, it's actually a real uh, spiritual thing I have with the bay. And 
I have loved it. I have grown up there. My family's been out here 125 years in this neck of the woods. And uh, matter of fact, they grew up on, uh, they came from Blackjack Island. You know, it sounds like a pirate hideout out there. But it's actually where all of those swooping cranes, you know, like to talk about all those swooping cranes that yeah. come in on the endangered list, that's where my folks came from, uh, Blackjack Island. And so you have, so pretty much over your lifetime, you have watched, now, is Calhoun County, isn't it in the middle of what is sometimes referred to as Cancer Alley? Well, I, I guarantee uh, it's on the mid-Texas Gulf Coast. A lot of people can't tell it from Louisiana. They, they come down here and they think they're in Louisiana, which is uh, certainly Cancer Alley down there. You know, you you mentioned earlier about uh, me starting midlife on a uh, this environmental uh, trek, and 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 the reason why is in 1989 when I was 40 years old and I was running a fish house. I think they were like I had like 14 shrimp boats and unloading them and icing them and all this good stuff. It's like it was the first time the toxic release inventory came out, and that was the community right to know that was passed by Congress after Bhopal, when Union Carbide just wiped out and killed, uh, I don't know, they say, you know, something like three, four, five thousand 5,000 people in one day. And so Congress passed this community right to know, and for the very first time, the communities around these chemical plants, I mean, they, they, they actually look like fairy castles at night because they were ablaze with lights. We were, our county, Calhoun County, which at that time maybe had 8,000 in the entire county, we were number one in the United States on toxic disposal and uh, it's um, unbelievable. It was unbelievable how something, uh, a community so rural, so hidden away, we're three hours from Houston, three hours from San Antonio, hour and a half from Corpus, we're three hours, four hours from Galveston, and this little spot was number one in the nation, and uh and that was what it was like. It was all this around you, and you had no idea what was going on in those plants. Well, Diane, just to, to play devil's advocate here, now, now you probably, obviously, you did not know what was going on inside the plants because they did not want you to know that, I expect, but surely as a shrimper, you had been seeing some little hints from Mother Nature that things were, I, I mean, weren't there, wasn't there something like dolphin die-offs and all, oh, all yeah. sort of, I mean, before Absolutely. 1989? Tell us about some uh, of that. Was, yeah, well, back in uh, 1989, there were, uh, like I said, we 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 found out through the the toxic release inventory it was newspaper article front page so that's how we got the data now we have shrimpers and like i said the whole town of shrimpers and when a shrimper is not uh uh having a shrimp season when it's winter when you don't have any money a lot of these guys they work inside of a chemical plant you know, and they might be on what they call the bull gang where you're out there and just working on these diesels or these generators and or they might be driving a truck for the chemical company. And they always, they always had stories about some of the really, really bad stuff they saw. But this is just, you know, industry would call it, oh, that's anecdotal and it's just stories and that's why. So the fishermen had stories and when they saw that a season could disappear or the entire bay can be a blanket of dead dolphins and uh that's what happened around uh, 1989 is we had one of the largest dolphin die-offs 
in the mammal stranding uh, network's history. And they were everything. We, we, we had more uh, buzzards out there than we had seagulls out there because they were eating on the dead dolphins that were washing up on the beach. And uh, matter of fact, if you went out in a shrimp boat and you were looking out and it looks like, uh, it actually looks like there were uh, blankets, you know, like these big quilts oh. spread across the bay. And it was disintegrating dolphins. And uh, I remember sitting at the fish house, you know, and a fish house is kind of like a tin building and it's sitting right there on the water and all the windows are open and everything's open and you can just... You know, I remember looking out th- those uh, windows and these big trucks came in, uh, some of these scientists from, you know, from the, from the federal agencies and scientists from all over the world were coming down there and they were hauling off the dolphins on these trailers. So, oh, yeah, we saw plenty of evidence and we had, uh, I know I had uh, fishermen that were fishing at the head of the river. And uh, they would they would come in and they would even bring me in fish that they wanted me to they wanted me to save them because they they said something was wrong with them because they were floating at the top of the water or they were just slowly turning and rolling and and, and it wasn't only the fish it was like the alligators were rolling and uh, so there were very definite signs you know not only that things started falling off, you know, like a a shrimp season could disappear, you know, and, and shrimp season just don't disappear. They don't be in the head of the bay uh, one month and then uh, they're gone the next. So there were, there were definite signs. And so, so you were 40 years old, so this was 30 years ago, so you, you, you had right. this epiphany, and here you were working in a shrimp house, and by that time you were, I, I think, a divorced mother of, of five kids? Five. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, very, very much so, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I just, was... Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, so you go just ahead. decide you're gonna you're gonna do something about this, and you don't mind saying you. I mean, you have a high school education, right? So you have a high school education. Absolutely. You're a divorced mother of five, forty years old, working in a shrimp house. You get this epiphany. That was 30 years ago, Diane Wilson. Uh, try to sum up uh, 30 years of your reaction to that. I mean, what what did you do with that anger when you figure when this hit you over the head? Well, the thing that is, it was it was an it was an outrage, but it but it was also there was so much I did not know. I did when I first started, I didn't know what a wastewater permit was. I didn't know how they got the permit. I didn't know the name of all of the industry down there. I didn't know what they were making. I didn't know about discharge points or where the discharge points were. I knew absolutely nothing when I started. But a a lot along with this about not knowing anything and being outraged with, with the little bit of information I had, like, being number one in the in the whole country is that uh, uh, is that when I the first thing I did I walked down because City Hall wasn't very far from Fish House so I walked down to City Hall and I went in that building and I asked them the secretary I said to let me uh, use their little there's a little community building yeah. and they, they let people uh give you know have a little parties there or or different things like that and i said i wanted to use that building i wanted to i wanted to talk about us being number one in the country and i just i just wanted a meeting i have never before ever asked for a meeting i had never before ever spoke up i'm a little bit of a introvert so i it was out of character for me to do this and within like two days 
I had city secretary come down to his house, and she told me, Diane, you're, you're, you're just going to have to let this go. Just let this go. It's, <laughs> we cannot let you have a meeting. And I'm like, why? And they're like, well, they're just red flags. It's just red flag. And then here come the bank president at the fish house. And here's a guy in a three-piece suit, shiny black shoes, and he came down to his house. I have never talked to this guy in my life, and he came down and said, Diane, are you trying to roast the industry alive? Are you getting a vigilante group? And I'm like, what? And I had no idea what was what was causing all of this uproar. I was just asking for a meeting. I hadn't even had the meeting yet. And then before you know it, I was getting the county commissioners. Before you know it, I uh, had uh, economic development that was calling my brothers who were fishermen and telling them to calm me down. And it's like, well, I haven't even done anything. (laughs) It blew my mind, the backlash, and I had just barely stuck my foot in the water. So a lot of it was just, I, I was just flabbergasted at the the backlash. And, uh, you know, and, and eventually I did find out what the real deal was. And, and it had to do with uh, not only were we number one and you just don't question industry in our neck of the woods, but for most of plastics, was planning the biggest chemical expansion Texas had ever had. And and they had pretty much said, you can get anything you want. We'll give you all the tax abatements you want. We'll dig the channel for you if you want. We'll give you all the pieces. We're going to rubber stamp everything, and nobody is going to say a word. And so that's what the big deal was. And then they bumped into you, and you did, and you did oh. so. <laughs> Oh, they, yeah, they, but, but, but you, you know, the thing of it is, is, you know, I was just a woman. I was a fisherwoman. I was in sea drift at high school education. So they did not believe I was what I said I was and what I was doing. So they seriously spread the word that I was a spy hired by Louisiana to kick the 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 chemical expansion out of Texas and send it to Louisiana. Well, have you now, ever that been was to, an honest to God rumor uh, all over the town. If you've ever been to Sulphur, Louisiana, uh, I think they might have Sea Drift, Texas built. A Sulphur, Indiana. I, I mean, I mean Louisiana, not a not Indiana. I'm I'm telling you all all, all through there. So anyway, I, I bet you got a real education now. When you started out 30 years ago, my guess is you were a reasonable woman. You figured oh, there was, was some sort of I EPA, Absolutely. Texas Department of Environmental Quality, for, to borrow an oxymoronic term. Did you believe that there were people looking, you know, looking after the environment and citizens' rights? I and did. <laughs> how long did that? I did. Well, well the thing that is, and, and I and I and I've said it, and I've written it in my book because it was such a mind blower that that was the biggest illusion for me. And it burst, and it was like a that's where you call the epiphany. It's like you, I actually believed, and I believe many people still do that haven't really <laughs> uh, started, you know. Tearing the onion uh, uh, limbs off the the onion is that you believe that these agencies and these politicians and these elected officials, these these federal law, the state law, you believe it. You really do believe that they are there to protect you, that they are there to make sure. Um, it is taken care of and the environment's taken care of and your health is taken care of. And that was the biggest illusion I had. And that thing, I mean, just blew all the pieces because that isn't what is going on at all. 
So when you when you came into this knowledge and you, and you started saying, "Huh, now I'm beginning to see the like," you can kind of understand the the industrialist. I call them the planet eaters point of view. But yeah. When you put that what you were going up against. And then you lost the illusion uh, that anyone was riding herd, as we say down here in Texas, uh, on these people. I mean, what? How did you work up the the energy, or, or what would you call it, the drive to you know this David versus I guess this Diane versus Goliath? I can't believe that you just didn't roll over like most people would at that point would have just said, obviously, I'm, uh, I'm outgunned here. And they just would yeah. have gone back to grousing uh, to their friends and, uh, you know, maybe put a Facebook post up and, and walked away <laughs> from it. How did you yeah. uh, end up where where you've been for the past 30 years where did you find the energy for this well, well I, I i tell you what you know when when it finally burst and when i finally saw all that was against me and who was uh uh you know how the writing on the wall was and how it was going to go how the the sweetheart deal was and you know i even had a very very big uh state environment out of Houston and I remember he came and told me he said just pat yourself on the back Diane did a good job did a good job but it's over with he said you're at the end of the parade you just forget it but you did a good job and I <laughs> said they are not getting the bay they are they are not they are not and I remember he said well what are you going to do and I said and I mean, I said this off the top of my head. I said, I'm going to do a hunger strike. <laughs> and he just cracked up, started laughing. He said, people don't do hunger strikes in Texas. He said, maybe in California, maybe in India, but they do not do them in Texas. And I said, uh, I don't care. I'm doing a hunger strike. And quite frankly, I had not the foggiest idea of how to do a hunger strike. I hadn't read anything on hunger strikes. I just vaguely knew about hunger strikes, but but the important thing to know about this was the idea of a hunger strike really frightened me because I had never done anything like that. I didn't know about it. It was like, but I knew if I slept on it, I knew if I went around and talked to a few people and asked their opinion, they would tell me. Do not do that hunger strike. So I immediately called the only reporter I knew, and I said, uh, I'm going to do a hunger strike. And it was related to Formosa. And they said, when? And I said, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> and I did. I started a hunger right strike then. Oh. Yes, I did, because I knew if I didn't, I, I would – you, you would just back out. You would, if you thought about it and slept on it, you'd wake up the next day and say, thank God I didn't do that hunger strike. Well, so and, what and the point, funny thing okay. is, you know, the funny thing is, though, I did that hunger strike on a shrimp boat, which is a bad place to do it because nobody can see you on a shrimp boat. <laughs> I didn't have a cell phone. Nobody knew I was there. But it eventually got out after two weeks. And the funny thing about that is with that hunger strike, with no support, with very little media, I got exactly what I wanted on that hunger strike. And that's when it dawned on me, the power and civil disobedience. Is that the point you went from being a reasonable woman to an unreasonable woman? Oh, yeah. That was it. That was it. And, uh, and, and, and that's and, what I've been doing ever since. That's what I've been. That has been, if you want to call it modus operandi or whatever, that's the way I did it. I do civil disobedience. So when did you <laughs> cross the point from being an unreasonable woman to being an eco-warrior? eco, what, eco -warrior? 
Yeah, or outlaw. Eco outlaw, <laughs> that's it. Uh, yeah. What's yeah, the yeah. difference? Well, Where is the dividing I, line between an unreasonable woman and an eco? The, the full title of this book is Diary of an Eco Outlaw, an Unreasonable Woman Breaks the Law for Mother Earth. So you literally, that's the point. I mean, as long as you were being an unreasonable woman, you were still within the confines of the, the, the Texas law. So the, the, is, is that the dividing line between an unreasonable woman and an eco? Is, is literally when you go outside the law. And how many times have you been arrested now, Diane? Uh, I've probably been arrested maybe maybe 20 times. And the longest I've ever spent in jail was like 120 days. I was in some bad jails in Texas, trust me. I can imagine some there's not ones. many good jails yes. in, in Texas. Uh, so, and, and, and any regrets? Oh, not at all. I always, but you know, I've been uh, working with the, uh, and talking with the people in Louisiana and, and they've kind of asked me what, uh, what I thought. And I said, I said, I only have one regret. And my one regret was that I didn't try harder. And I and I do. I believe. I believe. You know, it's like that little that little girl Greta out there, and all these other indigenous young people out there. It's like we can do it. We really can do it. But we have to get up and do it. And it's frightening. It's scary. And I always tell people. You know you're on the right path when you smell the fear, because it is. It, it's frightening when you get off that same old round and round track, and uh, and and you, you 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 know. And I think we're what much too well behaved. We're much too well behaved. So talk about get, getting out of your comfort zone. That is, you know, that's, as you say, that, that I, I think that is the biggest limiting factor why people are so well behaved. It, 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 it's like two parts. Like, like you say, the, 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 the initial wake-up call and, and then the second level about the out about actually starting to break the law but let's talk about the first part what your your advice to to someone someone coming to you saying you know well, I, I i i i want to start a career as an environmental activist but it's just scary to you know to step out of the comfort zone how would you yeah. coach people coming to you with uh, that that kind of question Give us some motivation. Well, I, well, well, one, I would tell them, because uh, I know a, a lot of what uh, people uh, are concerned about is they worry. They really worry, and they do a lot of planning, and they have, believe this myth is you got to have it totally organized. You got to have all these people. You got to have all this money. You got to have all these sports. And no, that's not the truth. I mean, you can begin without it. I, I, I totally believe later on, uh, you know, the people come. You know, it's like after 30 years, now I am finally, maybe not in my community so much, but, you know, around, I, I seem to have a lot more people who... Uh, uh, approve of what I'm doing than what I did before, but it's like one ninety percent of what people worry about never happens. It never happens. You just can imagine all these things, and uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, like a, for example, is uh, I was uh, doing a hunger strike in front of Union Carbide, and I had did a hunger strike in my truck in the ditch in front of that plant for 30 days, and uh, I remember, uh, you know, when people uh, get really, really concerned if you're on a hunger strike, you know, they, they think you're going to die, and, you know, and, and sometimes you're the worst people <laughs> supporting you, or you're like kin folks because they're like, oh, you can't do this, you're going to die, you're leaving your kids, and all this stuff, so, so you know, you, you, you've got that, but I remember after sitting 
for 30 days in front of that plant. And I knew I was probably going to be in, in the hunger strike, you know, maybe not too in the far, far too distant future. Yeah. And so I was thinking how I was going to end it. And there was a big 80 foot tower, chemical tower in front of me. And it was right there in front of the plant and you can see it from the road. And I was thinking, I bet I can climb that tower. And what I was a little worried about is I wondered if there was a motion detector on the fence. <laughs> and so uh, I, I got someone to just drive me through the plant, you know, in a truck. And, and this was uh, right after 9-11. So you'd think there'd be all the security, but there really wasn't. So anyway, I kind of got around the fence and no, it wasn't motion detected. And no, it wasn't electric. So about two days later, I got a hard hat, and we're down here on the coast, and there's a lot of offshore rigs, and you're always getting these hard hats that come floating in with the tide. So I got a hard hat. I threw a tarp over my shoulder, and it kind of looked like a rain gear. I put on sunglasses. I put on some boots, and I started walking towards the plant we're early in the morning when all the workers were going to the plant and uh, some uh, guys in a truck they saw me walking and I said I was heading for the plant lost my ride they gave me a ride square into the plant as soon as they got and went to their units I climbed out went over the fence and scaled that chemical tire I went straight to the top and I was at the top of an 80 foot tower at Union Carbide I was probably 6 30 in the morning and I was already up there and it was like and I had a banner which was the the tarp it was actually a big banner and uh and and, and I had a a big piece of uh kind of the exhaust off off of my shrimp boat you know which is made out of stainless steel and so I had a piece of it and I was going to lock myself down on top of that tower. And it's like nobody could see me. The whole plant didn't even know I was up there. <laughs> and finally, you know, maybe 30 minutes later, I saw this security truck kind of prowling around. And I got up, stood up on top of that tower, and I started waving well, in my arms. Here I the am, closet. here I am. And so that's when my... Uh, uh, my action on top of that chemical tower in lockdown started. And, and like I said, most people would be worrying to death, would be thinking there's no way you could do it. And, you know, was that the first time you were it. arrested? That was the first time? Uh, yes. And, and that was and more a than big 20, one. And I got more than 20 120 times. days in jail for that one. <laughs> You know, I admit, Diane, uh, I, I have, uh, I, I like pushing the envelope and running my smart mouth here on YouTube and all that, but uh, I, I have a healthy respect for the law, uh, well, a healthy disrespect, I guess you could say, for the law, but whatever it is, uh, it's still some sort of respect, and, 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 I, and I don't cross that line, uh, I, yeah. I, I admit uh, I, I was one of the few rules I was raised with with my my mama. My two rules was stay out of jail and stay out of the hospital and leave me out of the rest of your BS. <laughs> that, you know, I was the I was the yeah. bottom of five. By the time Good she got time. to me, stay out of jail, stay out of the hospital. That's all I'm asking. Okay, I'm 60 years old. I have never spent the night in the hospital or the jail. I admit my mama instilled a healthy fear of of uh, the cops, and uh, I mean you 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 have more common than than I do, girl. I, I have to say, but so are. I, I mean, I don't know if the word recommend is. is do, do you recommend people go to jail? Yeah, get, get, get go to jail. I, I have been I have been in jail, uh, like I said, and especially that like kind of like four months deal with me. The epiphany I got out of that yeah. is that everybody 
needs to spend at least two weeks in jail. <laughs> they would have an entirely Ugh. different perspective. One, on the people that are arrested and are in those jails and the sense of criminal justice in yeah. the United States. And it, uh, it was, uh, m- matter of fact, what in, 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 in that jail, especially with Harris County and Victoria County jails, that was probably one of the most traumatic, the things that go on in there is one of the most traumatic things that, I physically have ever experienced, but I, I want you to know what came out of that experience. We, I had a couple of friends and I wrote the stories of those women in that county jail. It is, and I mean, there was some tragedies and I mean, the, the health effects, there was a woman in there that lost her baby in there. They put her in, uh, uh, you know, where she she didn't have any help and she was in a plastic gown and, and uh, solitary. So there was some traumatic stories. But out of that experience, we founded the Texas Jail Project, which has been around now for 10 years, and it's located right there in, the, in the, uh, uh, Austin. And it's one of the best uh, criminal justice advocates for uh, for not only families but inmates. So, and the thing that is, it would have never happened unless yeah. I had went through that. It would have never happened. Well, you haven't you haven't quite convinced me to go get her, go get myself arrested. <laughs> now, did you ever bump into Dick Cheney in jail? No, I you did never, not. You I never saw not. him in a jail but, but you cell, but, but so you funny, tried though. to arrest him. Tell us the story of when you tried to arrest Dick Cheney and, and, and oh. sent him to jail. Uh, it, now, that was a battle you did not win, I take it. <clears throat> no, I, I've actually tried to arrest uh, several, several <laughs> How close Dick did Cheney you get and to also Dick Cheney? tried to arrest the, the guy, uh, uh, BP Chemical, when he went to testify in Congress. I had a uh, pair of handcuffs in my back pocket. You know, they were. <laughs> did you get? Did it was you a get, symbolic. Did you get even oh, one oh, of them? Who? What's his name? I, Tony. Who was that? Who was the guy? I'm, that man's name, Tony Hayward, or something. Oh, Tony Hayward. He was the guy. He was the one I uh, went after. And, and matter of fact, uh, uh, they just. You know, all of the, I was in the back. I was, I had been there since like two o'clock in the morning waiting <laughs> to get in for his, uh, um, you know, his testimony there at, in, in, in Congress. So I waited a long time. For so him. you were in the same, you got as far as the same room with that planet eater. How did that Oh, feel? I did. I got pretty darn close to him. <laughs> and, and the thing on the, on the other one, I got really close and, uh, and actually, so I had the handcuffs, and 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 you know, and they they were grabbing me, so I couldn't, uh, I couldn't actually handcuff him, but I <laughs> handcuffed the table. So when they started dragging me out, and I was handcuffed to the table, they had to drag the table out. <laughs> so it was, it was, you know, pretty interesting. How close did you get to Dick Cheney? Oh, I was right close to Dick Cheney. I was probably maybe five foot. Oh, really? You got within five feet yeah, of me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I Have got you watched pretty the darn s- close. Scrub the pretty slime darn off close of you. Yeah. Uh, but you didn't get the cuffs on him either, I guess. No, I didn't. I really didn't get any of them, but, you know... Well, well speak, There's always speak, next speak time. to that. Just that whole issue of that. So you've been to jail 20 times, and the head of Union Car, who is that, Warren Anderson? or uh, Warren Anderson, yeah. He's yeah. never spent a day in jail, as far as I know. He even when never Dick did. And, and as a matter of fact, when he went to <laughs> India, uh, you know, they'd say, oh, he spent time. He didn't do it. They had him in a house, and he was just staying at a house, I think, to... Uh, because he was scared of being around the people, so they had him in a house, and then he got on a plane and left. And I, I actually did a uh, protest 
on one, on the anniversary of Bhopal, I went and found his house in uh, uh, it's at the what do they call it near near Long Island. The, the Hamptons. Uh, those what those fancy places where Hamptons. all the beach is. Is it called the Hamptons or is it the Pocono? I always Hamptons. Get the, that's it. I always He's get those mountain ranges. The Hamptons. Mixed yes, I did. And I was at his house <laughs> for two days in front of his house. And believe it or not, he finally came out. He and his wife came out. Oh, really? And uh, Did yeah, you? they started talking to me. They were real upset with me, and <laughs> they didn't know who I was. And I said I was from a Union Carbide Plant in Seathrift, Texas. And he said, "You are no such thing. There's no Union Carbide Plant in Texas." And I said, "Well, there is most certainly a Union Carbide Plant in Texas." And so, uh, and uh, what was what was real interesting is that there was a little kid there with a tape recorder. And he had been interviewing me in front of uh, Warren Anderson's house. And and here old Warren Anderson and his wife are just talking, 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 and arguing with me in. With, and he turned around and saw that <laughs> tape recorder. And he started fighting over the tape recorder. And then he started chasing the kid down the road <laughs> with the tape recorder. <laughs> Pretty funny, actually. Uh, oh, I wish I had that. I wish I had that video of Warren Anderson yeah, chasing his yeah. kid down the street. They saddle. were very tanned. He and his wife were very tanned. I remember that. Well, obviously, you still it, it, clear, clearly you managed to uh, thirty years of doing this. Uh, you, you 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 still managed to keep a a sense of humor. Uh, how how do you do that with, with all, I mean, like with the Bhopal, I mean, good Lord, and, 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 and literally seeing from the inside what, uh, of jails in Texas and, and th what, 300 dead dolphins belly up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. How, how, how are we sitting here j joking uh, yeah. for the past half hour? How can yeah, you... and, and even even the books I write, they're, oh, they're I, hilarious. I, I tell people, I said they're they're real funny, they're they're real funny. It's uh, I don't know, maybe it's like dark humor. Yes, There's a tragedy, uh, a dark. It's a dark humor. It is a dark humor. And I, uh, yes, uh, it, Diane, it's a it dark is a humor. dark humor. It, is is that it? Did, but this dark humor, I, I mean, is it one of the things that that keeps you from going dark? Oh yeah. I, I think it does. I'm, uh, you know, I uh, I think what keeps me going is I do things that feed my soul. I stay. I think the only thing that I I have, you know, and I have, you know, for a long time I never had the support. There was no money. There was no backing. But I had my integrity and that was one thing I had and that was one thing I was not going to let go because it was the best part of myself and uh, I think that will feed you and and I don't get uh, I don't get burnt out although I did at one time I really did I tried to kill myself I took my shrimp boat out and I was going to kill myself just do it in. I'm going to do it in like Marilyn Monroe did. And, uh, you know, I just could die. I just could not die, although I was trying. Yeah. And uh, and so once I decided I wasn't going to die, because I, I was on a shrimp boat out in the middle of the bay, I, I uh, just picked up the anchor and came on back in and just started all over again. It was just a what they call it, dark night of soul. I had one of those. Well, I think I think we all need uh, we all need one of those. I, I've had a few of those. Yeah. I haven't had a I haven't had a dark night of the soul in a jail cell, but I've spent plenty oh. of them here in my own eight by ten foot bedroom in uh, in Garfield, Texas. I, I assure you, trying to uh, keep my sense of humor. Uh, with with uh, just now the mainstream media news, uh, yeah, you know, and so this is how I got re reminded of you, as it were. So, uh, good lord, we are how are we forty five minutes into this? Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, tell us about your most recent victory. Uh, you know, to give us some motivation. Uh, 
you know, I thought you had whipped for a for a Mosa Plastics butt twenty years ago, and now tell us about Nurdles and about your fight against your successful oh. fight against Nurdles. What's that all about? Well, uh, okay. Well, uh, one one thing I, I need to explain, and, and and really kind of how it's a little bit different uh, with my the folks that I work with is I work with the workers inside the chemical plant. And and the reason why I do is is there's no union down here. There's no protection for these guys. And when something goes bad or or something uh, really is done uh, harmful inside the plant and they can't abide it, you can't go to the chemical company. You cannot go to the elected officials. You can't go to the state agencies. You can't go to the federal agencies. And the last one on the list is me. And so they come to me eventually. And over the years, I've probably talked to, over 30 years, I've probably talked to 50 workers inside the plant. Some were injured workers. Some were whistleblowers. And so I got... I would have these guys that would come to me, and one of them was a whistleblower, and he worked in uh, utilities, which is wastewater, for 20 years at Formosa. And he saw a bunch of bad stuff, and he tried to blow the whistle on it, and state agencies, said FBI, you name it, and they did nothing. They, they pretty much hung him out to dry. And so anyway, he was no longer at Formosa, did he get fired he was, or did he quit? Uh, well, he, uh, they pretty much, when you start doing stuff and you're something of a whistleblower, uh, they don't want to fire you. They kind of, until they figure out what to do with you, they kind of put you in a place where you can't see anything or do anything, uh, you know, like uh, either a back room with files or <laughs> until eventually, I think with, with him and he, like I said, he was utilities. He, he managed utilities, and they had him in the ditch picking up trash. And so, uh, anyway, so he uh, eventually was no longer there. And uh, but he called me one uh, one day and wanted to talk to me. And uh, and I knew of him. I had never met him, but I knew of him. And so he was very very cautious where to meet. And that's the way they all are. They're very nervous and paranoid. And so I met him in a beer joint at uh, called the Hideout in Rockport, Texas, which is about 40 miles from around here. And uh, we uh, we met, and I remember when I met him, he was in a dark corner, and he had a cowboy hat on. And uh, the minute I went over to him, he grabbed my purse, started checking my purse for wires, <laughs> Because he thought I was wired, and eventually he was the guy that told me about all of these pellets, and I had never, you know, I I knew these about myrtles. the powder. I knew about the powder and the and and in blowing places, and you know the workers and hell in it, but I never realized the extent of the pellets, and uh, so I. Probably for 10 years, I uh, tried to reach through TCEQ. At that time, I think it was Texas Water Commission. Remember when it was train wreck, uh, TNRCC or whatever it yeah, was? Yeah, yeah. It was train wreck, and then it's now it's <laughs> TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Which is a hilarious and, oxymoron, right? Yeah, it is. It is. So <laughs> I have, for 10 years, I have fought the the pellet issues, trying to get something from EPA, from the state, from the eight, from the local people, from the chemical company, and nothing, absolutely nothing. And so, uh, so uh, me and a couple of workers, Formosa workers, former workers, they were one was retired. We started. Just collecting them. So these and are the, we just would, so people know what you're talking about, these are these tiny little, like they're the size of like BBs, and they're the, the They're kind of like BBs, they're, and they're, they're plastic, 
and they also is powders. There's flakes. There's and this there's goes into making yep. all this other plastic crap. And uh, but but yes. the the Formosa actually so Formosa they manufacture these little pellets, sometimes called nurdles. And then that, th right. then they sell those in bulk to other. They do uh, all the these companies make, that want to make uh, plastic, you know, raincoats, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, rain gear, Whatever, uh, yeah. uh, packaging, you name it. People buy these. What they call so, well, well, the fellows at the work and the chemical company will call them pellets. I think. Yeah. So uh, Formosa makes these. A lot, call they, them and, and so, but they're yeah. So they were uh, pellets. So they were getting into the literally just getting was it accidentally dumped? I mean, I under why would they be dumping uh, it was their like, own well, product? Well, a lot. Of, some of it, some of it was a releases, and a, some big releases. So yeah. I mean, like thousands of pounds. It was just like going everywhere. And the thing of it was, is the company cares about production yeah and as uh as formosa's lawyer said it in our trial it's like you know he was bragging and he's like formosa makes a trillion pellets a day so it's like a I trillion mean, so, so so what you're losing <laughs> a few billion pellets here and there and they you know so it's all about production and these pellets are lost in production they're lost in emissions they're lost in, I mean, because a lot of the units are wide open. Some of them are nine stories high, and it's just everywhere. And then they've got like 12 stormwater outfalls. And this means that it's only supposed to take rainwater from the plant and put it in the bay or put it in the creeks, except one, the, 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 Storm ditches are too small, so every time it rains a little bit, it floods the whole thing, and you have got this enormous amount of waves of powder yeah. and pellets that are going everywhere. And we find them everywhere. I mean, every day. Every day for four years over a 20-mile area, anywhere you went, you could find them. So you li literally gathered up millions of these things to, to use as evidence yes. against yes. This, this giant uh, chemical Absolutely. corporation, and and you won. I mean, so what was the final yeah. verdict? Amazing. Uh, the final verdict was the the judge. His name was uh, uh, Hoyt H O Y T. He had been appointed by Ronald Reagan. Uh, and when we went to trial, we hauled in all of these boxes. We had 30 <laughs> big plastic bins of probably 2,400 samples. And, uh, you know, you have to pull them through the security and all that. And we, we, we did, all, we did all that in the, and it, it blew my mind because I, I had been for 30 years, I had information, I had workers, I had documents, and we have never been listened to or we've never been seen and we've never been heard, and that judge heard us, and he saw it. And when he made a decision, I think he made a ruling in, uh, I believe it was June 2019, I mean, what he said, I, I nearly fell over. I still can't get over that he, that he saw it. He saw the truth, yeah. and it's the truth, but it doesn't get out. And he put it out there. I was like, wow. Oh, my gosh. It was unbelievable. And I guarantee you that kind of rattled Formosa. They knew they were in big trouble. So what did they end up paying, paying out? Uh, fifty million dollars. They agreed to zero discharge. We had uh, fifty million dollars that will go into all of these local projects, and uh, and and not only that, 
but we get, I mean, the citizens get to be a part of how they design that plant, how they're going to change it. We get to be a part of the monitoring, and if they violate the zero discharge, they get fined daily for every pellet they release, and it goes into a uh, Matagorda Bay Trust Fund, and we use that money for environmental projects around here, or around this area. So we have enforcement. We have monitoring. We can say how that bay is going to be cleaned up or how that creek is going to be cleaned up, and we get a decision and input on how they fix that plant. And I think that's unheard of. Okay. It, it's an amazing. It's amazing. Well, congratulations on that victory. And, and Diane Wells and I, I cannot believe we have been here for 56 minutes saying global industrial civilization is getting ready to collapse on this camera. So as I wrap up all of these conversations, and we could go on for hours. I, I wish I had just driven oh, down there and we were sitting there. Uh, at the hideout saloon right now, you and me. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, but maybe I'll come down there in a couple of weeks. But anyway, as I do with all of my guests, if you are not talking to Sam Mitchell on Collapse Chronicles for an hour, but you actually had the mainstream media sticking a microphone in your face saying, Diane Wilson, you have 60 seconds to send out your message to planet Earth in the waning days of 2019. What would that 60-second sound bite sound like? It would be never give up, never give up. That didn't even, that and didn't And just even, do it. That, and just do it like the Nike commercial. <laughs> just do it. Just do it. So, somehow find the energy. Well, uh, stick stick around after we, uh, after we hang up here. Uh, Diane, but I, I, need, I need to shut this down before uh, the camera does. So, folks, if you enjoyed this, uh, this little conversation I just had, please take a few seconds to thumb it up. Or if you're some uh, plastics executive who did not enjoy it, by all means, come thumb it down. <laughs> And my, if you want to uh, hear more of these interviews, please subscribe to Collapse Chronicles. And Diane Wilson, we really appreciate you uh, taking an hour out of your your fight to uh, save a little piece of Texas, uh, coming on here and visiting us today at Collapse Chronicles. And more than that, thank you for. 30 years of your untiring effort to get out there and and give them hell. And we do appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate that. I really enjoyed being on your show. Okay. We hope maybe someday we'll have you back. All right, guys. Sounds good. Thanks. Give them hell wherever you are. Always. Thanks for listening. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.